Hello, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue with the cost of equity. First, we're going to take a look at what we can do if a company decides to change its capital structure, or if we have to compute the cost of equity for, for a private company who does not have um, traded stocks. What we want to do is then to get to the um, systematic risk that's solely associated with business risk. And we call that the asset beta or unlevered beta. So this is beta that does not include any financial leverage. It is defined as the existing lever beta. So this existing lever beta is beta that we uh, come up with from uh, our regression. So this is the historic systematic risk. Um, or if you're doing uh, estimating this for a private firm, this can be the systematic risk of another com of another firm or for um, the entire industry, like the one that we just saw in uh, Professor DeMondran's uh, website. We need to adjust for tax rate. This is the historic effective tax rate of the um, of the company or of the comparable firm or the industry um, tax rate. And then this is the debt to equity ratio. So once again, this is the historic debt to equity ratio associated with the existing lever beta uh, or the industry or the comparable firm's debt to equity ratio. So the first step in adjusting equity beta is to take the existing lever beta that you computed from regression or uh, through um, uh, other means, and then adjust for the existing tax rate and debt to equity ratio to get the unlevered beta. So this is step one. Step two is you introduce the new financial leverage. So the new lever beta is the unlevered beta that you computed in the last step. And then you put in the new tax rate as well as the new debt to equity ratio. Since we know the difference, so this is the beta which should be lower, this is unlever, versus the lever beta, uh, as you can see, as long as the debt to equity ratio is uh, greater than uh, is greater than zero, this will be great. This entire term will be greater than one, so the lever beta will be higher than the unlever beta. The only time they are the same is if that is zero. If that is zero, then of course they are one and the same. So let's take a look at the role of financial risk in um, in systematic risk. We can actually estimate directly the amount of premium, meaning the additional return that will be required because of the financial risk. Um, if we take the difference between the lever beta and the unlever beta times the market risk premium, so this is a market return, the risk free rate, so the difference between the two is the market risk premium. So this is a difference in risk and times the market risk premium, which is the price of risk. And that of course is our financial risk premium. Another thing that we may want to take into account is the amount of cash that a company holds. Um, the reason for that is because cash is risk-free, right? Cash doesn't have any risk. Uh, if I have cash, I can use it right away. So the firm value, we can adjust for using the cash to firm value ratio. Firm value is defined as market value of equity plus debt. Uh, because debt oftentimes do not have market value, uh, oftentimes we are we have to use book value. So the if you take the unlever beta and you correct for cash, you take the unlever beta divided by one minus the cash cash to firm value ratio. So cash to firm value obviously is the amount of cash divided by firm value, as the name suggested. Let's take a look at an example. Let's use Amazon. So the beta, which is the, obviously this is a lever beta, is 1.25. Amazon has, um, based on its income statement, we computed an average tax rate of 12.56% or 0.1256. Um, 
This is the actual tax rate, and it has a debt to equity ratio of 1.013. So that's actually very high. Uh, what that means for a dollar that you, uh, Amazon has as an equity, actually borrow more than the dollar in, uh, in liabilities. And the company's cash to firm value ratio is 0.2937. So first, let's compute the unlevered beta. We know unlevered beta is equal to beta. So it's 1.25 divided by 1 plus, and then 1 minus the tax rate, which is 0.1256, times the debt to equity ratio. So that give us an unlevered beta of 0.6629. And we can adjust for risk. Um, so oh, I'm sorry, we have to adjust for cash. So the cash to firm ratio is 0.2937. So the unlevered beta corrected for cash is 0.9385. So the this will be higher because the unlevered beta included cash. And cash has a very low risk because it's virtually risk-free. So what we have to do, is, uh, so if we take the cash out, then the true business risk, remember this is unlevered beta, the true business risk is actually higher. So let's take a look at how good our, our uh, estimate is. So if we look at the retail online, unlevered beta is 1.02, and the retail online unlevered beta corrected for cash is 1.05. So Amazon is slightly uh, has a slightly lower risk, but is in the same ballpark as other online retailer. You look back at Professor DeMondoran's uh, website, you see that he has the lever beta for each industry. It has the industry debt to equity ratio, the uh, industry effective tax rate, uh, as well as unlevered beta for the industry, uh, cash to firm value ratio for the industry, and unlevered beta corrected for cash for each industry. So you can, uh, if you are doing the cost, estimating the cost of capital for a privately held firm, you can simply use the unlevered beta corrected for ca cash for a particular industry, and then adjust for um, the risk of the um, current company you are estimating. So how do we do that? Let's take a look at another example. So let's say you have a privately held online retailer and this company's own tax rate is 25% and its debt to equity ratio is 0.2. In addition to that, we also need some market and, and industry data. Uh, so remember the industry on level beta is 1.02. The expected return on the market is 11% and the risk free rate is 3%. So we can then compute the level beta for Sybil um, using this formula that we've seen before. So level beta is equal to unlevered beta, so 1.02, times 1 plus the after tax so 1 minus 0.25, so this is a tax rate for Sybil, times the debt to equity ratio for Sybil, which is 0.2, and that gives us the lever beta. And once we have the lever beta for Sybil, we can then compute the cost of equity for uh, Sybil using the capital asset pricing model. So uh, uh, the CAPM equation says that the cost of equity or the expected required return is equal to the risk free rate, so 3%, plus beta, which we just computed, times the market risk premium, which is 11% minus 3%. So the expected cost of equity for Sybil turns out to be 12.38%. Now that you have seen two simple examples, let's do um, one more. Uh, this case, we're going to take a look at three different companies. So Whirlpool, IBM, and Target. They are in many, they are in very different industries. So Whirlpool is in the um, appliance industry. It has a market beta of 2.27. And Target is a retailer. It has a beta of 1.2. And IBM is software. It has a beta of 0.78. Let's assume that the U.S. Treasury yield, remember that we're going to use this as a proxy for the risk-free rate 
we assume it will be 3.5%, or we estimate it will be 3.5%. The market risk premium. So this is the market return minus the risk free rate. So the premium is 5%. So that means the market return is 8.5%. Uh, we're going to use uh, a template, so if you uh, pause your video and download the cost of capital template for associated with Chapter 11, uh, and we will continue, um, we're going to compute the following. We're going to compute the cost of equity, the unlevered beta for each of these company, and we're going to assume that each company is a candidate for a potential leverage buyout and we're going to see if we change the capital structure to 75 percent debt and 25 percent equity how would that impact the new beta and also the new required uh, cost of equity uh, for each of this firm okay um, now we open up the template and if you haven't done so, make sure you download it and open it so you can follow along. Uh, we're going to compute the cost of equity. So this is, let's first compute the current cost of equity. So that is the capital asset pricing model, which says is equal to the risk free rate times the beta, which is our current beta, times the market risk premium, which is 5%. So if you see something totally off, you say, oh, I must have made a mistake. It's the risk free rate plus <laughs> the beta times the market risk premium. Okay. And we can copy that for all three company. So you see that Whirlpool has a, um, a higher cost of equity, mostly because it has a higher beta. Um, next, we need to compute the unlevered beta. And to compute, before we can compute the uh, unlevered beta, we need the existing debt to equity ratio. So let's compute that. We have debt divided by equity. And let's take a look at R3. As you can see, the debt to equity ratio for uh, Whirlpool is much, much higher than um, the debt to equity ratio for IBM. Um, and for Target, um, they are about the same. So now we can compute the unlevered beta. So remember the formula. Um, if you don't remember it, uh, make sure you write it down so it's easier for you to create this. So the unlevered beta is equal to the current beta divided by one plus one minus the tax rate. So tax rate is 35% times the current, the existing debt to equity ratio. And again, we can copy it across. So we see that the unlevered beta um, is if the difference is even greater between Whirlpool and Target. And that is because um, Whirlpool is in the cyclical industry, so it's mostly appliances. People will uh, definitely delay their purchase when times are bad, whereas Target is a retailer and is a um, you know, average price retailer, um, your sales is unlikely to be affected by um, the ups and downs in, in the economy. Uh, the same is true for IBM. Uh, IBM is in the software um, uh, area, so their income is mostly through contract with businesses, so that is also relatively uh, low risk. Next, let's take a look at what happens if they do go through with the restructuring. If they go through with the restructuring, first let's take a look at the new debt to equity ratio. Uh, we know that the new debt is going to be 75% divided by new equity, which is 25%. So the new debt to equity ratio would be 3 across all, all three companies. And the new beta 
so this is using the new leverage of um, three or depth to equity ratio of three. So to get the lever beta, we need once again, if you don't have the formula memorized, make sure you write it down so it's easier for you to create the, um, the Excel model. So it's equal to the unlevered beta times 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate, which is still 35%, times the new depth to equity ratio of 3. And not surprisingly, uh, they all increase. Um, and if you compare the re-rise beta versus the existing beta, you see that they all went up, but um, IBM went uh, increased by almost three times, two and a half times, and that is because the existing depth to equity ratio for IBM is very low. It went from 0.3 to 3.0, so, so 10 times, um, whereas um, Target and Whirlpool both increase, but it's about the same amount of increase. And we can then also com compute the revised cost of equity. So we know that's equal to the risk-free rate plus the new beta times the market risk premium. So you can see that the cost of equity almost double uh, for IBM if it increases is depth to equity ratio to 3.0. So this shows you the magnitude of change due to change in leverage. Next, we're going to take a look at another type of capital. This is the debt capital. So how do we compute the cost of debt? The cost of debt is the yield to maturity for a firm's liability. And it's very important, this is not the stated interest rate, this is the market interest rate. So the to maturity changes. Uh, whereas the coupon interest rate, once the firm, a bond is issued, remains unchanged. Because interest on liabilities are tax deductible, it's an operating expense, we will use the after-tax cost of debt, uh, which is equal to the yield to maturity times one minus the tax rate. Uh, some firm will actually disclose the yield to maturity um, for both their, um, their liability as well as operating and financing lease. If a firm does not disclose it, we can still compute the cost of debt. So let's say we have a bond issue um, currently has 20 years left to maturity. The coupon rate is 9% and coupons are paid on a semi-annual basis. The bond is currently selling for $908.72 and the par value is $1,000. Uh, we will compute the cost of debt. We can use the spreadsheet function. And the spreadsheet function requires um, the following input. Um, the first is the number of interest payments left. Since the bond has 25 years left to maturity, and coupons are paid semi-annually, you'll have 50 payments left. Uh, periodic coupon payment is, so this is 9% on the par value of $1,000. That will be $90 per year. You get paid twice per year, semi-annually, so that will be $45. The future value is the par value of $1,000, and the present value is the current market price, which is $908.75. Uh, keep in mind the inflow and outflow assumption in Excel. The interest payment and the future value will always be positive, and the price will always be uh, negative. So let's input this into Excel. Here are the information that we have. It's actually a good idea to put down the payment frequency separately here. So par value is you'll get, you get pay at maturity. And this is the price today, obviously. 
remember we're gonna the function we're gonna use is the interest rate function or rate and we said here are the f arguments so number of period payment present value future value so it's useful to um, compute that ahead of time. You can actually, once you get familiar with it, you can put it in all at once, but it's easier to to write it out um, with all of them. So this is the number of period, and then the payment amount, um, the present value, uh, and the future value. So as they say, number of payment is 50, because it's 25 years, you get paid two times per year. And the payment is based on the coupon is 9% on $1,000, again, divided by the number of, number of payments per year. Uh, the present value, remember we're going to make that negative, is the price. And then the future value is the part value. So the U to maturity is the interest rate. So the number of period the payment amount, the present value, and the future value. Now remember, this is on a semi-annual basis. So this is every six months. So to get the U to maturity per year, we have to multiply this by two. And that gives us the U to maturity per year. And it's easy to have a quick check to see if you're on the right ballpark. Um, so we know that the price is less than the par value. Uh, that means this bond is still selling at a discount. Um, that means the coupon rate should be less than the yield to maturity. In fact, the coupon rate is 9% and yield to maturity 10%. So our check checks out. In addition to debt, we also have other forms of equity. One is preferred stock or preferred equity, and the other is non-controlling interest. The cost of preferred stock is the simply dividend rate on the preferred stock. So what that means is um, this is the required return, the cost of preferred stock. So P here stands for preferred stock. So dividend, that's the dividend um, for preferred dividend, and P is the price of preferred stock. So simply take the dividend divided by um, the price. For non for non non controlling interest, um, this represents the minority uh, ownership of less than fifty percent, um, and the cost of non controlling interest is simply the cost of equity for the subsidiary. Uh, this is so. Um, you will compute this the same way as you would compute the um, the cost of equity, but you will do that for the subsidiary. To put all these together, we'll use a weighted average approach. We call this the weighted average cost of capital. As we noted, this is a weighted average. So W stands for weight. So WD is the weight of debt. WP is the weight of preferred stock. This is the weight of equity and the weight of non-controlling interest. So D is debt, um, P is preferred stock, E is equity, and NCI is non-controlling interest. R represents the required return or cost of capital. So RD is cost of debt, RP is cost of preferred stock, RE is cost of common stock, and so forth. And this is the tax rate applicable to the debt. The weight average cost of capital is sometimes referred to as the cost of assets because it is the overall cost of capital to the entire firm. So both liabilities and equity. We're going to continue using example three. So call up the template that you have been working on, and we're going to apply um, the weighted average, use it to compute the weighted average cost of capital. Okay, here's the template that we finished a little bit uh, ago. So we have computed the cost of equity. Um, and we're going to compute the weighted cost 
rated average cost of capital now. We have to do three things. We have to first compute the percentage of debt and the percentage of equity. For these three companies, they don't have preferred stock and they don't have non-controlling interest. So it's relatively straightforward. Um, so the debt ratio is equal to debt divided by the sum of debt and equity. So here's debt and here is equity. So that's the debt percent. And of course, one minus that would be the equity percent. You can also double check to make sure that you did it correctly. And that's always a good idea. So we can also compute equity. So that's equity divided by the total. So debt plus equity. And of course, the two has, when you add it up, you have to add up to one. So let me do that here. So this is just a check. So we can copy it to the other. So we know that it works out, so we can delete the check. So here are the debt percentage or the, debt, the weight of debt, and this is the weight of equity. Remember to compute the weighted average, we take the weight of debt, so here, times the cost of debt, which we were given. So the cost, uh, borrowing cost, so this is a pre-tax borrowing cost, is 6.1% for Whirlpool, times one minus the tax rate. And we have tax rate of 35% plus the weight of equity times the cost of equity. So we computed that. We could, you can also co compare the two. So this is the existing cost of equity, and this is the existing with the average cost of capital. Now we know how to compute the cost of equity, the cost of debt, um, the cost of um, other types of capital, including preferred stock and non-controlling interest. And we also learn how to put it together into a weighted average cost of capital. We will stop this video here. In the next video, we're going to look into valuation. See you soon.